This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org to discover more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Spooktacular people, welcome to the History Goes Bump Anniversary Special 2018 Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane. Today, History Goes Bump turns four. I cannot believe that I have been doing this podcast for four years. Like every other independent podcaster out there, when I started this, I thought it would just be a fun little side project, a little hobby, something to do in my free time to share a love I had of haunted history with other people who probably shared that same kind of love. I had no idea what History Ghost Bump would grow into. It's been a phenomenal ride that I have enjoyed entirely. I've learned so much and I've made so many new friends in both the podcasting world and with you, the listeners. First of all, I want to thank you, the listeners, for listening to this podcast because without you, there really would be no podcast, not only because I would simply just be talking into a microphone. Most of the locations that we have covered on this podcast have been suggested by you guys, the listeners. And something that is very unique about History Goes Bump in all of the podcasting world is that I have listeners come on with me to share about these locations that are in places that are near their homes or places that you visited, places you've had experiences. Usually most podcasts are looking for authors or experts. I don't really care if somebody's trying to sell their book or if they think they're an expert in the paranormal or if there's some celebrity out there. All I care about is you guys, the listeners. We've covered some really well-known places, but a bulk of our episodes feature locations that I imagine a lot of people have never heard of before. And I really love getting emails where people say, I never even knew this was in my city. I'm going to go check it out. And the whole reason I'm able to do that is because you guys suggest them. Because these aren't things that are just out there all over the place where ghost shows are going to them or the internet has a whole lot of information. When History Ghost Bump started, it was very unique in the paranormal world. There was nobody else doing haunted historic locations. Most paranormal shows were covering haunted locations here and there, but they also were looking at UFOs cryptids, and other things that are in the paranormal world, whether it's psychics or mediums, things like that. You know, your coast-to-coast type of material. But for the most part, there really wasn't any podcast out there focusing on haunted locations, telling people the history and experiences that are being had there, which is why I started doing the podcast, because I wanted a podcast like that. And I said, it's not out there, so I'm going to do it. Now there's a ton of them out there. But one thing that I think that I have that a lot of those other podcasts don't is locations that are not really well known. And so I really treasure that that's something that I have focused on. A lot of things happened with History Goes Bump over the last year. We had some new things that we did. We did our first live show and had a great time hosting that with Pleasing Terrors and Hillbilly Horror Stories. And then going over and taking a couple of groups of people through Waverly Hill Sanatorium with us. It was a great time. And I expect that we're going to have more live shows in the future. We hit over 3 million downloads of the podcast, which is just amazing for an independent podcast to hit those kinds of numbers. So thank you guys for listening and sharing the podcast because that's how that happens. But we also had some hard things happen for the podcast. I know that I have mentioned the divorce between Denise and I on the podcast, obviously, and it's clear that we are no longer together. And that's one of the big changes that History Goes Bump had over the past few months is going from a dual hosted show to a single hosted show. 
And for those of you who are my friends on Facebook, you pretty much know the details of what's going on in my life. I've shared a lot of that there. I've shared a bit with the Spooktacular crew and a bit with the HGB Losers Club. But at the tail end of the anniversary special, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened, why Denise and I got divorced, and how things are going to be in the future. I want to thank my fellow podcasters out there for all of you guys giving me the support that you have, for sharing my show, for having me on your show, for interviewing me. I've appreciated that over the past four years, and I'm looking forward to doing more of that in the future. Because the listeners are so important to me, I don't want to just make the anniversary show about me and History Goes Bump. I want to showcase you guys as well. You are all so very talented out there. So many of you are crafters and artists, and then we have a lot of writers. And because I'm a writer myself, and three years ago I thought, wouldn't it be fun to do a flash fiction contest? Because flash fiction is quick, it's easy, it's something that you can put easily into a short podcast to share with other people. Easy to record, easy to put out there, but not easy to write right? To all of those of you who've competed over the years, flash fiction is some of the hardest stuff to create because you've got to put out characters and a theme and the drama and wrap it all up in less than a thousand words. And a thousand words goes really fast. This year, we had 17 of you enter the contest. I want to thank Tiffany Wilson, Tim Stevens, Jennifer Blakely, Brandon Michener, Candace Nelson, Boxedwater John, Ginger Strusel, Cindy Fellows, Sarah Emmons, Sarah Gunther, Dolly Ruther, Laura Jovog, Leanna Sapien, Miranda Stanley, Whitney Zahar, Samantha Begay, and Leslie Pollock. Thank you to all of you for entering the Flash Fiction Contest. As is the case every single year that we do this, coming down to our final five, which is two runners-up and our three winners, is always very difficult. I never do this by myself. The main reason being, I don't want to be biased. I don't want to look down and say, oh, this is one of my executive producers and think I want to give them a little bit more because they're giving back to the show. So I always ask other people to read with me and to help me make the final decision. So these are not just ones that I've picked. These were mutually agreed upon, and I'm very excited to share them with you. We'll begin by reading the two runners up, and then we will read third place, second place, and first place. I also like to have people help me read these, so I am joined by our administrator, Kelly Rang, and she's going to read a couple of the stories as well. We have our first runner-up, Whitney Zahar, who wrote Sweat and Ice. Sweat and Ice by Whitney Zahar. Marlena barely swayed on the rusted swing in the ancient playground. The rough toe of her sneakers scuffed against the gravel. Looking up made her head heavy, a mistake in this heat. She licked her cracked lips, wishing for a sip of yummy lemonade to soothe her parched throat, but that would mean moving. Marlena was convinced any movement would make her little body melt. Her skin was already peeling from a previous sunburn, the new skin beneath flushed and wet. She wiped her eyes, wincing as a perspiration stung them with salty droplets. A baking bluster of wind blasted down the avenue, scattering scorched brown leaves. Marlena watched them caper with dry, hissing sounds. Across the deserted avenue, her house beckoned. There was a promise of air conditioning and cold drinks to soothe her tender skin. Marlena dug her tongue into her cheek, considering. She rose to her feet, her damp clothes sticking to her body. The ancient dogwood tree in her front yard creaked in the hot wind as the front door opened. Marlena froze, goosebumps rising on her flesh that had nothing to do with the temperature. The shadow figure lounged in the open doorway, waiting in suspense for Marlena to come in. The black mass throbbed and writhed like fog on the threshold, hypnotic and frigid. Come, child, she imagined it saying to her. Don't you want to escape this terrible heat? The house is dark and cold, and I'm lonely in here. Come inside. Marlena stood still, watching the shadow figure that had been part of her life in that rambling Victorian house for so long. At first, the occurrences were small. Misplaced items, footsteps, and disembodied sounds in the night, blobs appearing out of the corner of her eye. Everyone in her family had experiences, but only Marlena was nervous about it, especially after the appearance of the shadow figure. It would always appear in corners or doorways, always whenever Marlena was alone in the house. She didn't know if it was male or female. The voice she always heard in her mind was too raspy to identify. 
It never hurt her, but the voice in her head just raked through her like burning sandpaper. Every time it appeared, the air went out of the room. Every time it disappeared, Marlena would be left with a chill in her brain, a cold sweat layering her pale skin. And yet, here she was, her little body shaking from fear and weaving from the relentless heat of the outside sun. Staying outside in these searing temperatures would surely make her sick. Soon her skin would be burned again, and she would be so dry the hot wind would scatter her flesh and bones like dust. The shadow figure whisked and waved in the coolness of the doorway. Come inside. Marlena's hands clenched around the rough swing chains, drenched too much in the sweat of heat and fear. She wavered, not knowing which was worse. At last, she took a single step. Thank you, Whitney. That was wonderful. And I really feel afraid for that little girl. Our next runner-up was Laura Jovag. Friendly text by Laura Jovag. I thought the first text was funny. You're cute, it said. I didn't recognize the number, so I texted back, Do I know you? There wasn't a response. I figured somebody had made a mistake. A few days later, I got another text from the same number. You're still cute. I was a little annoyed, but I just responded with, I need to know who you are. Again, no response. It was almost two weeks later before I got another text. It was, I like you. It's probably a prank, I thought. I used the computer lab after school that day to look up the number online, but the results didn't give anything more than residential, which was useless. I would have to pay to do a reverse lookup, and I decided I didn't need it that badly. I probably forgot about it in the general swing of life. I had a full class schedule in volleyball, and I volunteered as well. It will look good on your college application, I was told. I didn't mind. There are worse things than visiting the retirement home and playing the piano for old folks, and I like volleyball. The next text came soon after I got home from the volunteer job, I noticed. I began to wonder if it was one of the old folks being cheeky. I knew a couple of them had cell phones, but I didn't recall giving anyone my number. The new message said, you were nice. I responded with, thank you, and left it at that. If it was an old person, they would probably be reassured by that, I told myself. The text kept coming, and I paid attention to when they arrived. Yes, it was usually within a day of a shift at the retirement home. I was convinced it was one of the seniors. The texts were all very innocent and kind, so I responded with thanks and not much else. I didn't bother to ask who it was anymore. Our team that year was great, and we were headed to the regional volleyball playoff when I got a text that said, tell bus driver to slow. I was confused. I showed it to the coach, who called up to the driver to slow down for a bit. The driver asked why, and the coach yelled, superstition, which made everybody on the bus laugh. The driver slowed down, making a big show of it. We weren't laughing a few minutes later when a semi jackknifed in front of us. We'd been closer to the semi when I got the text. We watched the semi sliding down the road in front of us, sparks flying as it tipped. A car that had been next to it was flipped. When we stopped, we jumped out and rushed to help with a first aid kit and teenage adrenaline. An hour later, the police sent us on our way. We had plenty of time to reach the hotel, but all of us were shaken. Everyone on the team wanted to see the text. Everyone was talking about it. One girl insisted on doing a reverse lookup on the phone number and paying for it. We were holding our breaths as the result came back. Line out of service. You think it's one of the senior citizens? Asked the team captain. I thought it was, I responded. They must be tech savvy to spoof a phone number, she said. After much urging, I texted back, Thank you. I think you saved us. There was no response. The tournament went well, better than we'd expected. We weren't a top seed, but we made it to the state tourney, which was a first for the school. Everyone on the team was lauded around school. Word got around about the strange text, and I heard a lot of theories about it. I tried not to think about it. I had too much on my plate. During a shift at the retirement home, I asked one of the attendants if any of the senior citizens had worked in technology. She made me tell her the whole story. If it's one of ours, she said, I think you're best to just be grateful. It doesn't sound like they want to be known. I agreed. The state tournament was fantastic. We didn't win, but we came in a solid third, which was the best the school had ever done. I got enough court time to feel like I'd contributed. I didn't even blink when I got a good job text from my mystery number on the way home. A few weeks later, I was chatting with one of the old men who always tried to stump me with song requests. I'd learned a lot of old melodies thanks to him. He had some sort of dementia and sometimes made no sense, but that day he seemed fairly together until he started talking about ghosts. They like you, you know, he said. Who does? I responded. The ones still here. The ghosts. They like your music. I'm glad, I said, trying to humor him. Do you want me to play something? He nodded and I played a piece I'd just learned. 
It was a little jazzy, and he nodded along with it happily. When I finished, he smiled. They say they're glad you didn't get hurt on the bus. They said it takes a lot of work to text you, but it was worth it. As someone who has worked in an elder care facility, I really loved this story just because I could only imagine what it would be like if we knew about all the ghosts that are hanging out in these quote unquote old folks homes and to think that they still might be watching over us in the afterlife. All right, so we have our third place finisher here and this is Cindy Fellows and the name of her story is I'm My Mother's Daughter. Cindy is going to get a medal and also a t-shirt of her choice from the Emporium. So congratulations to you, Cindy. I'm My Mother's Daughter by Cindy Fellows. Watching someone pass away even after a long, difficult illness is never easy. When does a person actually cross that line from life into death? What happens to their soul? Is there really a heaven and a hell? As I sat watching my mom gasping for her last few breaths, I thought about how difficult our relationship as a mother and daughter had been. She always favored my older brother. He was her green-eyed, fair-haired son who could do no wrong. Well, at least in her eyes. I was the black sheep of the family. No matter what I did, she complained that it was either done wrong or I didn't do enough. As I grew older, the emotional abuse seemed to only get worse. She tried to come between me and my family. Fortunately, they saw with their own eyes her devious ways and never fell into her trap. But she was my mother, so I did the best I could to be a caring daughter. Ironically, my father had passed away several years before my mom. He idolized her and she made him choose between me, his daughter, and her, his wife. Of course, he chose her and played into her manipulation against me. And to make matters worse, he had set up their living trust so that I was the executor and the person in charge of my mother after his death. Now, this was no small task as my mother was blind, hard of hearing, and in a wheelchair. After my father died, I had to deal with constant demanding phone calls at all times of the day and night with her wanting everything from socks to a new couch. And the calls were never pleasant. She would screech into the phone calling out my name. Sandy, Sandy, Sandy. In person, it was much worse and she would try to follow my voice and give me a sneering look with her blind, cold eyes and screech, Sandy, Sandy, Sandy. I'd even tried to hire a person to come in and cook and clean and take care of my mom. But since that had been my idea, she was so mean to the poor lady that she quit after a few months. I finally had to put her into a rest home. I knew she was very angry at me for doing so, but for her safety, she needed more care than I was able to give her at home. Of course, my brother didn't have to be concerned with such details. He only had to make an appearance every few months to see her, and she was thrilled that her golden child had gone out of his way to visit. You know, he is very busy and an important man. She cursed at me and screamed, Sandy, 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 I'll never forgive you for this. So here I sit alone by my mother's bed with my husband and daughters waiting patiently in the hall. My brother, her favorite child, couldn't come to be with us while she slowly slipped away. You know, he is a very busy and important man. It's difficult to see someone as they slip away, even for someone who's lived a long life and had so many disabilities. I'm not able to communicate with her as her hearing and eyesight are now gone. She had originally been gasping for air, the rattle of death taking over her body. Now her breathing is almost a whisper. I should comfort her by holding her hand so she knows she is not alone, but the hurt and pain I've suffered from her won't allow me to touch her. The room is stifling hot, and the smell of death is in the air. Her chest rattles, and she stops breathing for a few seconds, but gasps again. This went on for several more times, and then quiet. I called for a nurse, and she rushed in and listened to her heart. She takes several minutes, but confirms that she thinks she's dead. She said she was sorry for my loss and quickly scurried out of the room. I don't know how to feel. I feel sadness for her lost life but relief as she's no longer suffering. I tried my best and was with her until the very end. As they say, the best thing to have when a loved one dies is to have no regrets, but our difficult relationship was finally over. Just then, her head slowly moved so her eyes were looking straight into my eyes. They were no longer cloudy with blindness, but bright and clear. Sandy, Sandy, Sandy. I'll be waiting for you. Wow. 
Wow, that just creeped me out right there at the end. Nothing like thinking mother has come back and is waiting for you. (laughs) Made me think of Psycho for just a moment. Our second place finisher is Ginger Strusel with the story Tuesday Ween. Ginger is also going to be receiving a medal and the long sleeve t-shirt of her choice from the Emporium. Tuesday Ween by Ginger Strusel. There was nothing better than a Saturday night Halloween. Sam dressed up in the wackiest costume she could find, donned colorful wigs and rainbows of makeup, and hit the town with her favorite skeletons, witches, and vampires. But Halloween on a Tuesday sucked. Sam spent her Tuesday ween with Cup Ramen, Hocus Pocus, and her unhappy cat, Pumpkin. Smile, Pumpkinkins, she bargained with toys and treats, but Pumpkin wriggled out of the kitty-sized witch hat before she could snap a good picture. Despite being roughly the size and shape of a pumpkin, that feline moved fast. She perched on the back of the couch, grooming her fur back into place with a yellow-eyed glare. Sam brushed orange fur from her jeans and dug into the candy bowl. Nibbling chocolate kisses, she binged her way through an hour of campy witches and four gaggles of pint-sized ghosts and ghouls. By nine, she was three movies down and almost out of chocolate. There were never many trick-or-treaters on a Tuesday. Guess I'll have to eat the rest by myself, she grinned and popped another handful of candy into her mouth. Pumpkin let out a disapproving meow. I know. She scratched Pumpkin's ears and peeled herself off the couch with a groan. Responsible adults don't eat the whole bowl of candy. She grabbed the bowl, intending to set it somewhere out of easy reach. It was too hard to resist. The Snickers kept looking at her. She pivoted for the door, tucking the bowl under her arm. Thunking her witch hat back on her head, she opened the door. You kids are out late, (laughs) she said, managing a witchy cackle between yawns. Two kids stood on the front steps, their hands shoved into their hoodie pockets and hoods tucked tight around their faces. The taller one slouched with the cool disinterest of a teenager taking his kid brother around the neighborhood. The smaller one just stared, pale and unnerving as a china doll. Not big on costumes, huh? Unless creepy kids and hoodies were the latest costume trend. They looked up at her not saying anything. Not big on talking either, she grumbled. Kids were so creepy. She held the bowl of candy out, tired and eager to flop on the couch again. Take all you want. You guys are probably the last trick-or-treaters of the night. But they didn't reach into the bowl, grabbing butterfingers and skittles and greedy fistfuls. Instead, the older one stepped closer. May we use your phone, ma'am? She jerked back in horror. Ma'am? Did they think she was an old lady? Frowning, she dug her phone from her back pocket and thumbed it open. Are you lost? She kept a tight grip on her phone, wary of letting them hold it. It wouldn't be the first time someone had snatched it from her hand and bolted. Not that phone. The teenager's voice was as smooth as black glass. The one inside... I don't have a phone inside, she huffed. Ugh, asking if she had a landline was almost worse than the ma'am. She was 30, not 80. I can call your parents. Scanning the street beyond, she saw no one around. No creep pursuing them or peeking out from a bush. No danger lurking behind them. Fear crawled up her spine on spider legs. Maybe she was the one in danger. Uh, you sure I can't call your parents? Or the cops? She couldn't shake the feeling of wrongness deep inside her stomach. Then she glanced back at the kids, right into their tar, black eyes. Gasping, she stared at the candy bowl she had dropped. Cracked down the middle, it bled honey bits and Reese's pieces like a gutted pinata. Don't try and run, the taller boy commanded, and Sam froze in horror. If we wanted to hurt you, we would have. Unable to move, Sam studied the kids' faces. Pale, bloodless skin, black eyes. There was no iris, no white, all black. Goosebumps pimpled her arms, and she squeezed cold, sweaty hands into fists. We don't want to hurt you. We just want you to let us in. Sam's heart drummed a warning rhythm. She had to move. No way! Accepting her candy dish as a casualty of war, she slammed the door shut and locked it. She panted, cold and sweaty like she had gone running in the rain. You got me! Now take your candy and go home! She yelled through the door, not caring whether they heard. Creepy kids! 
Shivering, she pulled a protesting pumpkin into her arms and stalked around the house, checking every door and window to ensure they were locked. Then she crept back into the living room. Silence blanketed the house as she turned off the TV and finally breathed. Pumpkin hissed and dug her claws into Sam's arm. When she let go, Pumpkin bolted off with a yowl. Drawn in like a fly wrapped in spider silk, Sam stepped toward the front door. Peeking through the peephole, Sam saw only the mesmeric black of ancient eyes as hollow and deep as caves. Let us in. Let us in. Let us in. Rose an arcane harmony around her, accompanied by thumping raps at the door. She reached out trembling, fighting the muscle and sinew that tugged her forward. No. She willed herself not to move, screaming in her mind as her fingers fumbled for the lock. If she opened the door, she was dead. Her hand, numb and wooden, closed around the doorknob and turned, moving as if on marionette strings. She opened the door and spread her arms in welcome. Why don't you kids come in? She asked in a voice that wasn't her own. A smile stretched the younger boy's mouth, tight and too wide. Our mother will be here soon, he said, and they both stepped inside. And finally, but not least, a little drum roll, please. Our first place winner for the HGB Anniversary Special 2018 is Tim Stevens with his story, That Wretched Sound. Tim will be receiving a medal and the hoodie of his choice from the Emporium. That Wretched Sound by Tim Stevens It comes at night. That terrible sound, the horrible soul-severing sound that wrecks me to a shivering heap, though I cannot understand why. And how many long nights have I endured it? It seems endless. Yet, every night I long for its return, for in my seclusion all else is silence, and the silence is maddening. But so is that sound, that terrible, wretched sound. (laughs) How shall I describe my hermit's chamber? A simple room, four walls of mortar and stone, a place to lie myself down, to kneel beside in contemplation. I have no lamp, but there is no need. I have no book, and nothing with which to record my thoughts, which are few. But this chamber, it is not all shadows and obscurity. There's a luminous quality to the air, coming perhaps from some shaft or a crack up high in the ancient walls. Though I mark the passing of day to night by its waxing and waning, I've been here so long that I've lost all track of time, and indeed, purpose. I know nothing else. And when my chamber recedes into that duskier blackness, then comes that wretched sound, and I know it is night. But when all is not so black and I seek respite from the madness of my own thoughts, I study the ancient walls. There are symbols inscribed there, carved in perfect lines in the dark stone. The symbols are familiar, but their formations make no sense to me. It drives me to further madness, and I surrender once more to the oblivion of silence and unknowing, for this is more comforting. Thus I've spent the passing days tumbling headlong into what seems an eternity, yet ever growing I am plagued by an invasive thought, or rather shall I say, truth. I will go mad or I must destroy myself utterly and enter that greater oblivion from which there is no return. And tonight, as the light wanes and as I kneel in the last moments of silence before the dark and returning of that wretched sound, I know I am at the crossroads. I must discover the source of that wretched sound, or by God, I will strike myself against the old stone walls until all is finally silent forever. I kneel, eyes closed, head against my hands. I needn't open my eyes to know. It is tangible. The darkness. And... My God, it is unbearable. The sound pierces the room. It descends and echoes, falling on me like freezing rain, burning me like flaming arrows, deep, racking sobs. The voice is feminine in tone, but utterly broken, utterly destroyed, utterly hopeless. They stir in me something cosmically untenable, and as I attempt to block it from my burning brain, I can no longer. I rise. The world spins. The darkness is absolute. I catch myself against something cold and hard, the old stone walls. My fingers find the familiar symbols carved there, a flash in my head, an image I don't understand. I push it from my mind. 
I push myself forward, away from the walls, towards the wretched sound, that sobbing, wretched sound. For a brief, eternal moment, I'm in the abyss, blind, and the sound my only guide. I push on when suddenly my hands find something new, something strange, yet unshakably familiar. I run my fingers along its cold, smooth surface, and it fills me with an abysmal fear. The cries, that voice, it sets my brain alight, burns every fiber of my being. I want to turn, but to turn is self-immolation. I cannot bear it a moment longer. I push with both hands the cold, smooth surface, and it gives. A cold, blue-white light floods across my face, blinding me, and with it, silence. I pause a moment, shielding my eyes. Slowly the pain recedes. My eyes adjust, and I see finally the source of that wretched sound. She kneels on the stone steps, a wan, pale thing, eyes red and wet from tears. Her eyes, they fix on me. Her face, a blank look, without understanding, soon replaced with another. Terror and madness. She rises, screaming, guttural and screeching, a sound infinitely worse than before. She runs wildly into the night, and it is in this moment of harrowing I finally understand. I turn to face the opening of my chamber, illuminated now by the cold light of the moon. My eyes fall on the symbols carved into the wall, and I now understand their meaning. Four words. Here lies. The other two, they are my own name. I just loved the way that ended. I had no idea where it was going. And then as it finished up, I just thought, wow, that is a glorious story. Thank you for sharing that with us, Tim. Congratulations to all of our winners. And again, thank you to everybody who contributed. I'm really looking forward to seeing what everybody puts out next year for the fifth anniversary. All right. So I know many of you out there have been wondering what happened. Diane and Denise got a divorce. They seem so happy on the show. Well, as is the case with many marriages out there, there sometimes comes a point where it's just time for both people to move on. I believe in a thing called soulmates, and I believe that there are many soulmates that we can have in life, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a love partner for you to have a soulmate. I think a lot of people are friends with soulmates as well. I, however, didn't know that there was a term for an individual who could be your quote-unquote soulmate, that one person that was made for you. And so I always referred to Denise as my soulmate because that's what I thought she was. As I was going through this divorce process, a listener educated me a little bit on something called a twin flame. And this is somebody, it's almost as if you were separated from each other at some point in time before maybe you were here or who knows how that all works. But you come together later and the minute you meet each other, it's as though you've always known each other. It's like my other half. When you hear people say, this is my other half. It really is like this other half has come and you are now together as a whole. And while Denise has always been a soulmate for me, she was never my twin flame. We were together for 24 years and I was very happy for most of that time. But as we start to get older, for a lot of you millennials that are listening, we have these things called midlife crises. And I don't know why it's called that because I don't believe we go through a midlife crisis. I think a lot of people, as you get older and you become more matured, you start realizing that there's more years behind you than you have ahead of you. And so you start to survey your life. So it should be more like a midlife review rather than a crisis. You kind of look at where am I at? Is this where I hope to be at this point? And where do I want to go in the future? And one of the things you ask yourself is, who do I want to spend the rest of my life with? October is not only Halloween month, but it's also my birthday month. I'll be turning 47 this year. And as I get closer to 50, I've been asking myself those questions a lot more than I used to. Now, my intention was to always be with Denise, to stay with her until death do us part. And I was very committed to the vows that I made. It just so happens that earlier this year, I met somebody else, and it actually was a listener to History Goes Bump. And as we got to know each other a little bit better, I started to have this revelation to me that it was like I'd always known this person. We immediately clicked with each other, and I don't know, it, to me, it's very hard to explain but I just felt like this is the person that I was meant to be with. This is the person who was made for me and I was made for her. Now, the unfortunate thing is I'm married to Denise and this other woman was also married. We're both very committed people. We believed in the vows that we had made. So our initial response to realizing that there was something else going on other than friendship with each other was to say we were going to stay in the situations that we were in. 
Uh, but as you go along a little bit and you start thinking about the what could have beens and things of that nature, you start to realize what's the right thing to do in this situation and what's the fair thing to do in this situation. It's a situation I never imagined that I would be in. And at first I thought the right thing to do is obviously you stay in your marriage and you stay committed because that's what you're supposed to do. That's what the world tells us to do. And as a Christian, that's what I believed I was supposed to do. And so that's what I was going to do. But then I started thinking about, is this the fair thing to do? Is it fair to anybody? Is it fair to me? Is it fair to this other person that I've fallen in love with? And is it fair to Denise? I can't imagine spending the rest of your life with another person that you're married to always wondering if they're thinking about somebody else and wondering what it would be like if they were with that other person. To me, it was not fair to keep Denise in that kind of a position. It also, I felt, was not fair to me to not pursue something that is what I felt meant to be for me. Making the decision to get separated and divorced from Denise was incredibly difficult. And I hope nobody thinks that I just did this lightly and that I broke Denise's heart and kicked dirt at her and walked away. In doing this, I lost a lot. I was going to lose my home. Tiana, who you used to hear her collar in the background, I'd have a lot of people ask me about, what is that tinkling noise in the background that sounds like some kind of ghostly thing? And I'd be like, oh, it's just Tiana's collar. Or even before that, it was Rafiki's collar. I don't even get visitations with Tiana now. So I've completely lost my dog. I lost my house. The podcast that I've been producing for you guys the past six months, I've been doing out of a very small room. And then I've been living out of boxes. Everything I own is in storage. But I haven't let that hold me back from producing the podcast and keeping up with all of the commitments I made to do meetups and travel around the country to see people. I've maintained all of that over the past six months, all while trying to get my life back together again. And it has not been very easy. I care very much for Denise. I'd hoped that we could remain friends. I don't think that's going to be the case, unfortunately. I also lost a core group of supporters to the podcast through this. There were parts of me that thought, well, maybe I should just stop doing History Ghost Bump. But I feel that I have done what is the right thing for me and for me to be happy in my life. And I believe it's very important that we do things that make us happy because one thing that I have learned through History Goes Bump is life is very short. And if you don't spend your life pursuing happiness and trying to be happy, I don't understand the point of it. So that is what happened. And on the surface, yes, I left Denise for another woman. I hope that people don't see it that way. I don't feel that that's entirely what I have done here. I want nothing but her happiness in the future, and I hope that she someday meets her twin flame, because I clearly was not that. Now, I want to share with you who this other person is. Many of you already know her. She is the admin for the Spectacular Crew, Kelly Rang. We are engaged to each other. Sometime next year, there will be a wedding, and uh, we're not going to be making a big affair of it. So I hope that clears up anything. I am looking forward to the future here. What we have coming up, we have a lot of great shows coming in October. As we ramp up the Halloween, I like to get into some of the more creepier subjects for this. And we have a lot of great locations set up for the rest of this year. We'll have our Christmas special coming up. And we have a lot of listeners that are on tap to bring on to the podcast as well to share things with you. Mort will be sharing eulogies starting in November. We're going to get as many of those in as we possibly can to each episode. There are quite a few of you, so it's going to take us a while to get through them. And I don't want to bore people with just tons and tons and tons of eulogies, but we'll get them all squeezed in as quickly as we can. And I've already been looking at some of the things that Mort has been coming up with, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. I always end the episodes with this episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. And I'm going to do that with the anniversary special as well. But on this one, I like to read out all of our executive producers. All of you, every single show are bringing it to the people who are listening. So I like to thank you all at least once a year again for your contributions to the show. So we're going to stroll here through our cemetery and read off the names that we have on the various mausoleums, chest tombs, marble headstones over there on the niche wall and our garden crypts and thank all of our executive producers. That's Dave and Ann Student, Melissa Patasini, Anna Frias, Matthew Deegan, Richard Tyrell, Kristen Sandell, Jade Lewis, Cindy Wad, Robert Flood, Christine Klein, Susie Dumi, Jennifer Svoboda, Walter Mose, John Kanya, April Barber, Cindy Fellows, Tammy McCarroll Burroughs, Lee Gibson, Matthew Hirons, Christina Bray, Rachel Sajuskowski, Katie Bigelow, 
Ruth Schulte, Emily Reidner, April Garassi, Brett Swinson, Deborah Mobley Burns, Gina Lavoy, Jennifer DeLeon, Jennifer DePriest, Melissa Nelson, Debbie Seeger, Amanda Wachuda, Flynn Fletcher Dobson, Amy Smith, Brianne Barr, Shelby Hammond, Gwen Cohen Brown, Lori Zold, Mackenzie Grondel, Susan Silk, Jules Havlicek, Katie Stayancho, Whitney Zahar, Jennifer Williams, Jenny Lee Watt, Paul Pisano, Beth Vanderyat, Bobby and Joy Watts, Deb Blackburn, Teddy Clark, Rocky Mellon, Jennifer Almond, Brian Jones, Renee Cochran, Jennifer Bach, Dolly Ruther, Tracy Duhon, Roger, Liz Evans, Stuart Putney, Amy Martinez, Mark Fathers, Jen Belkus, Roxanne Goon, Melody Davis, Roberta Mason, Allison Schneider, Don Wood, Mark Shoemaker, Joseph Tamilonis, Kathy Webb, Joanne Lum, Beth Lale, Andrea Valdez, Andrea Valdez, Rhonda Mayfield, Jennifer Taylor, Laurel Christick, Margarita Magalon, John Venezia, Teresa Rowland, Dean of Twisted Philly, Karen Miller, Tim of History Dweebs, Bella Patiasina, Stacey May, Jessica Peterson, Glenna Becker, Pamela Ennis, Kathy Benzunas, Jerry of Hillbilly Horror Stories, Eleonora Cornejo, Margie Wittick, Ginger Galloway, Kelly, Camille Good, Bonnie Galtney, Tom the Viking, Patrick Wolf, Kathleen Kenna, Colin Champ, Don O'Crean, Karen at the Stat Podcast, Sabrina Mendoza Quispy, Marianne Scabine, Sebastian Hunter, Beth Kelly, Chris Key, Christy Bacon, Cassia Boaz, Edel Henhofer, Tanika Axberg, Quinn Sucher, Chelsea Bosch, Veronica Betts, Ariel Schroeder, Dr. Over Van Thwappenstein, Tamara Buckley, Kellyanne Wallace, Becky Anderson, Laura Williams, Louis Urquillo, Rachel Pardo, Karistan Cooper, Stephen of the Is This Adulting podcast, Rosemarie Ward, Lisa Amanda West, Melissa Potter, Nikita Ernvazacht, Cheryl Lynn, Cheryl McReynolds, Andrea Canio, Yesencia Martinez, Chelsea Smith, Tiffany Wilson, Helen Jones, Sari Sarath, Angie Wallingford, Laura Jovag, Pac-Man Impact Site, Kristen Calderon, Sarah Parrott, Nancy Doy, Dan of The Lift and The Wicked Library Podcasts, Maxwell Parker, Cindy Pierce, Krista Klein, Joanne Cohen Veda, Jennifer Larson, Kevin Bale, Annie Caradillo, Barb Niles Barrett, Christine Bell, Amber Vanderwolf, Lauren Craig from the Spectral Asylum podcast, Kathy Bolter, Rebecca Davis Nord, Melissa Smith Deal, Kim Butler DeRose, Ken Milligan, Jason Magana, Molly Smith, Paula Mitchell, Heather Isery, Wander Pup Wrangle, Gabe Finnegan Veers, Sherry Day Armand, Brianne Sanford, Candace Nelson, Bob Sherfield, Emma Pett, Julia Miller, Aaron Peel, Tiffany Schaefer, Patricia Gross, Preston Headley, Mariam Waller, Aaron Byrne, Cerise Locke, Taylor Grimm, Jamie Ha, Mary Beth Gardner, Tracy Buckman, Adam Smith, Emily Prokop of the Story Behind podcast, Aaron, Lillian Fitz of the Knock Once for Yes podcast, Deborah Darling, Corey Untalon, Yel Gammond, Matthew Zubka, Joy Serpus, Karen Udell, Pamela Newsom, Mindy Hull, Heather Dufresne, Break Channel 13, Nicole Cardarelli, and Nicole Mercado Champagne. Thank you to all of you for contributing to the History Ghost Bump podcast and being executive producers. And nearly all of those names that I called off are going to be having eulogies read by Mort. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this anniversary special. Thank you for sharing the show. It means so much to me. I would love to grow and grow and grow more in the future. And that is if and that happens when you guys share the show. So thanks for doing that. You take care now. Bye-bye. Hello, listeners. Mort here. Join me in the cemetery. I've got a cozy grave for you and Diane has videos, bonus episodes, logo gear and the HGB Losers Club for you. Go to patreon.com forward slash history goes bump and support the show.